So this lecture we're going to be talking about natural line broadening. So you remember back to, I think it was our first lecture, that one of the very useful properties of lasers was that they're monochromatic, meaning that if we plot the intensity of the light emitted versus the frequency of that light, they were very close to a single frequency. Now, in an ideal world, this would be absolutely one frequency that the laser emits but unfortunately in the real world there's many processes that uh, means that we can't get this ideal case and all lasers emit a range of frequencies and this range or band of frequencies that they emit is generally called the line width of the laser now there's many mechanisms for increasing this line width uh, as they're called broadening mechanisms. The one we're going to be talking about today is natural line broadening which is the fundamental limit of what we can get with a line width for a laser. Um, so what causes this limit? And you'll remember back to our second lecture that we talked about something called spontaneous emission, which was some event that where we had two energy states, that an electron in a higher energy state would randomly drop down to a lower energy state, emitting some photon with an energy equal to the difference in these energy states, which would relate to the fre photon's frequency by 2 pi, by two pi the photon frequency and Planck's constant. Now, we said that this was some random event, which it was, which it is. Um, and of course, in it being random, this photon also has some random phase and direction that it's emitted at. But what actually triggers this event? I mean, that's a very deep question that we should ask. What causes this electron to just randomly jump down? Like, does it have a mind of its own and just go when it wants to? Um, you remember we also talked about some time constant that the population in this level um, or the rate of change of population of electrons in this level was proportional to the actual population itself and the constant of proportionality we gave it some time constant so it was an idea that electrons have some lifetime in this upper energy state. Now. What actually causes them to go down to this uh, lower energy state and what determines this time constant or rate of change is very fun something very fundamental in physics. It's something that you're probably familiar with. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Yeah. So there's a, many forms of this, but one of them. Oh, I'll write that again. Is that the uncertainty in energy multiplied by the uncertainty in time has to be greater or equal to this fundamental limit of Planck's constant divided by two. Now I'm not going to prove this. It's a well-known um, formula. Uh, or principle in physics um, but what this essentially means is that if we think about it if we have a photon that has some energy yeah then using Heisenberg's uncertainty principle we can get the idea that this photon can exist or there's some uncertainty in its time which is related to the photon's frequency which equals 4 pi v0. So you can think about in the vacuum it's not actually empty the vacuum contains an infinite set of modes which all just happen to be or on average are in the grand state of being unoccupied but in reality 
there's always virtual particles and photons popping in and out of existence all the time and this relates to this Heisenberg's uncertainty p principle that we could have a really really energetic particle popping out but in order to obey this you could only exist for a very short period of time so here we've written out that if we have a photon that's admitted with some frequency um, v or w then this implies that it can exist for some uh, some some time period which is related or has this inequality relating to its frequency yeah now this all sounds really crazy at the moment but as it turns out this is actually measurable so one really cool thing is that at the Australian National University they have a experimental setup which actually measures these vacuum fluctuations and because they're random in nature um, they can use this to generate perfectly or absolutely random numbers which is really useful for a lot of programming applications um, also there's this crazy thing called the Casimir Kas force um, so I'll go to the next page so another idea is that these particles or photons that are brought into existence um, they have to satisfy some boundary conditions so for example if we have some cavity set up the only photons that can pop into existence here are the modes of this cavity because it has some boundary conditions so for example light waves that can create standing waves within this cavity yeah now if we think about this outside this cavity we have free space or a vacuum so essentially there's infinitely more modes of light that can be brought or pop out of the vacuum outside than can be uh, created within this cavity. Now photons carry some momentum, so there's something known as photon pressure that would be pressing against these plates. And so the photon pressure, pressure on the inside of this cavity is going to be a lot less than the photon press pressure from the outside of the cavity because we're going to have a lot more photons being created out here than within the cavity. And this actually exerts a measurable force on these cavity walls. So the name is oh, Casimir Force, I believe. So that's another interesting thing. Now, <coughs> So what we have, have now is that we have this electron in an excited state. Now some photon can just randomly pop into existence, satisfying this inequality that we had before. Um, wait, where was it? So that... To all the 4 pi b. And therefore, the uncertainty in the energy has to be less than or equal to just a W here. Yeah. And then this photon is going to just happens to pop into existence at this energy. With an energy equal to this difference, and then that's going to cause some. Well, in this case, you can see there's a resemblance of stimulated emission. Spontaneous emission is stimulated emissions from photons popping out of the vacuum. And so this is going to create another photon with the same phase and direction of this random vacuum photon. But then after this time constant t, this photon is going to disappear and we're only going to be left with that one that popped out so you can imagine now you can see how this relates to some fundamental time constant that if we have some population up here and these photons are going to be popping in and out of existence at random time intervals but it's going to create some time constant for how long these can be or stay in this higher energy state. So that'll cause one to go down, emitting a photon, and then the other one will be erased. 
Yeah. So if we now think about this case about the electric field, if we consider the scenario where we have all these electrons in the higher energy state and they're stable up there and we just have these uh, vacuum fluctuations happening and that's causing this emission of extra photons and then the vacuum photon disappears. Yeah, we're going to get some, if we think about the electric field time, we're going to get some field amplitude multiplied by this decaying amount, uh, this decaying exponential, where the decay rate is equal to this time constant, which is that time constant that we were talking about from the um, spontaneous emission in the second lecture. And we've just included a factor 2 here to account that the intensity is equal to the square of the electric field. So that just makes our life a little bit more easy later. Um, and then the field oscillating at this frequency which is related to the energy difference between the two states. Okay, now you can imagine that if we, what we want to do now is look at this in frequency space. So how do we do that? We do that by taking the Fourier transform and you can imagine that if we ignore this exponential decaying constant and we just have this uh, cos term here, in frequency space that's very equal, we're just going to have a single peak at this frequency omega naught. So, and of course that relates to an, I, our ideal um, idea of a laser, but in reality we have this decaying time constant. So, if we continue and remember our Fourier transform, we have that in the frequency space the Fourier transform is equal to this And we had our expression that ET was equal to but we'll write this out as normal frequency. Yeah. Which we can also write this if we remember our trig identities. We have this. Um, so looking up standard tables for Fourier transforms, we can find Fourier transforms for these expressions where we have both oscillating frequency and some decay rate. And what we get if we then evaluate this integral using those tables is this expression here. Intensity is equal to this, which is the permissivity of free space, 
etc. And sorry, I think before I incorrectly stated that the intensity was equal to the square of this electric field, where in fact it's just a proportion, uh, proportional to it, with the constant of proportionality being this. Okay, so when we evaluate this, what we end up with is a Lorentzian function. Yeah, so we end up with in frequency space we have where this is the intensity of the light which is going to determine the peak of this function where we have defined this delta mu mu to be equal to 1 over 2 pi to this time constant of spontaneous emission yeah and so what this is as I mentioned is a Lorentzian function and if you plot this intensity versus frequency we get this where the line width is equal to this factor here and inter interestingly line widths are measured by something called full width half maximum so full width half maximum which is used because, interestingly, if you try to evaluate the standard deviation of a Lorentzian function, it turns out to be undefined or infinity. So the idea of standard deviations for Lorentzian functions are undefined. So instead they had to improvise and use this idea of full width, half maximum. So it's essentially the width of this profile at half the maximum, so 0.5i where this is. I up here, the maximum intensity. Okay, so that comes to the end of this lecture. So we can see that this fundamental time constant for the spontaneous emission fundamentally determines the uh, line width for lasers, yeah? But in reality, there's a lot of other mechanisms that broaden this line, such as um, Doppler line broaden broadening and um, other types that we're going to talk about in future lectures. Um, yeah, and until next time.